Welcome, fourth graders, to your new read aloud. Today, we will be reading chapter one of Matilda. Matilda is written by the same author as Fantastic Mr. Fox, Roald Dahl. As you are reading with me, make sure that you have the volume turned up, make sure that you have it full screen so you can read with me. So our focus as we read chapter one is going to be good readers understand the characters and setting, the where and when, the location, of the story. They, meaning you guys, can pick out the problem and solution of the story. Being able to find these four things will help you to comprehend, meaning understand what is happening in the plot structure of Matilda. As I read, focus on the story elements, keep them in mind, the characters, who the story is mainly about, the supporting characters. Our protagonist is going to be Matilda. The setting is where the story mostly takes place, the problem, events that are happening to the main character, and the supporting characters that causes conflict, the solution, how the main character solves the problem, and the theme, the lesson that Matilda is going to learn throughout each chapter. Chapter 1 is the reader of books, so read with me, fourth graders. It is a funny thing about mothers and fathers, even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister we could ever imagine. They still think that he or she is wonderful. Some parents go further. They become so blinded by adoration they manage to convince themselves their child has qualities of genius. Well, there's nothing very wrong with all this. It is the way of the world. It is the only it is only when the parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we are that we start shouting bring us a basin we're going to be sick meaning they want to throw up school teachers suffer a good deal from having to listen to the sort of twaddle from proud parents but they usually get their own back when the time comes to write the end of term reports if i were a teacher i would cook up some real scorchers for the children of dotting doting parents. Your son Maximilian, I would write, is a total washout. I hope you have a family business you can push him into when he leaves school because he sure as heck won't get a job anywhere else. Or if I were feeling lyrical that day, I might write, it is a curious truth that grasshoppers have their hearing organs in the sides of the abdomen. Your daughter, Vanessa, judging by, by what she's learned this term, has no hearing organs at all. I might even delve deeper into natural history and say the periodical cicada spends six years as a grub underground and no more than six days as a free creature of sunlight and air. Your son, Wilfred, has spent six years as a grub in the school and we are still waiting for him to emerge from the chrysalis. A particularly poisonous little girl might sting me into saying, Fiona has the same glacial beauty as an iceberg, but unlike the iceberg, she has absolutely nothing below the surface. I think I might enjoy writing end-of-term reports for the stinkers in my class, but enough of that. We have to get on. Occasionally, one comes across parents who take the opposite line, who show no interest at all in their children. And these, of course, are far worse than the doting ones. Mr. and Mrs. Warmwood were two such parents. They had a son called Michael and a daughter called Matilda. And the parents looked upon Matilda in a particular as nothing more than a scab. A scab is something you have to put up with until the time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away. Mr. and Mrs. Warmwood looked forward enormously to the time when they could pick their little daughter off and flick her away, preferably into the next country, or even further than that. Oh, next county, or even further than that. It is bad enough when parents treat ordinary children as though they were scabs and bunions but it becomes somehow a lot worse when the child in question is extraordinary 
and by that I mean sensitive and brilliant. Matilda was both of these things, but above all, she was brilliant. Her mind was so nimble, and she was so quick to learn that her ability should have been obvious even to the most half-witted of parents. But Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were both so gormless and so wrapped up in their own silly little lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. To tell the truth, I doubt they would have noticed had she crawled into the house with a broken leg. Matilda's brother Michael was a perfectly normal boy, but the sister, as I said, was something to make your eyes pop. By the age of nine, of one and a half, by the age of one and a half, her speech was perfect, and she knew as many words as most grown-ups. The parents, instead of applauding her, called her a noisy chatterbox and told her sharply that small girls should be seen and not heard. By the time she was three, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. At the age of four, she could read fast and well, and she naturally began hankering after books, meaning she wanted more books. The only book in the whole of this enlightened household was something called Easy Cooking, belonging to the, her mother. And when she had read this from cover to cover and had learnt all the recipes by heart, she decided she wanted something more interesting. Daddy, she said, do you think you could buy me a book? A book? He said, what do you want a flaming book for? To read, Daddy. What's wrong with the telly, for heaven's sake? We've got a lovely telly with a 12-inch screen, and now you've come asking for a book? You are getting spoiled, my girl. Nearly every weekday, afternoon, Matilda was left alone in the house. Her brother, five years older than her, went to school. Her father went to work, and her mother went out playing bingo in a town eight miles away. Mrs. Warmwood was hooked on bingo and played it five afternoons a week. On the afternoon of the day when her father had refused to buy her a book, Matilda set out all by herself to walk to the public library in the village. When she arrived, she introduced herself to the librarian, Mrs. Phelps. She asked if she might sit a while and read a book. Mrs. Phelps, slightly taken aback at the arrival of such a tiny girl, unaccompanied by a parent, nevertheless told her she was very welcome. Where are the children's books, please? Matilda asked. They're over there on those lower shelves, Mrs. Phelps told her. Would you like me to help you find a nice one with lots of pictures in it? No, thank you, Matilda said. I'm sure I can manage. From then on, every afternoon, as soon as her mother had left for bingo, Matilda would toddle down to the library. The walk only took 10 minutes, and this allowed her two glorious hours, sitting quietly by herself in a cozy, excuse me, corner, devouring one book after another. When she read every single children's book in the place, she started wandering round in search of something else. Mrs. Phelps, who had been watching her with fascination for the past few weeks, now got up from her desk and went over to her. Can I help you, Matilda? She asked. I am wondering what to read next, Matilda said. I finished all, all the children's books. You mean you've looked at the pictures? Yes, but I've read the books as well. Mrs. Phelps looked down at Matilda from her great height, and Matilda looked right back up at her. I thought some were very poor, Matilda said, but others were lovely. I liked the secret garden best of all. It was full of mystery. The mystery of the room behind. And that's Mrs. Phelps looking down at Matilda and Matilda looking back up at her. The closed door and the mystery of the garden behind the big wall. Mrs. Phelps was stunned. Exactly how old are you, Matilda? She asked. Four years and three months, Matilda said. 
Mrs. Phelps was more stunned than ever, but she found the sense not to show it. What sort of book would you like to read next? She asked. Matilda said, I would like a really good one that grown-ups read, a famous one. I don't know any names. Mrs. Phelps looked along the shelves, taking her time. She didn't quite know what to bring out. How, she asked herself, does one choose a famous grown-up book for a four-year-old girl? Her first thought was to pick a young teenager's romance of the kind that is written for 15-year-old schoolgirls, but for some reason she found herself instinctively walking past that particular shelf. Try this, she said at last. It is, a, it is very famous and very good. If it's too long for you, just let me know and I'll find something shorter and a bit easier. Great Expectations, Matilda read, by Charles Dickens. I'd love to try it. I must be mad, Mrs. Phelps told herself, but no, but to Matilda, she said, of course you may try it. Over the next few afternoons, Mrs. Phelps could hardly take her eyes from the small girl sitting for hour after hour in the big armchair at the far end of the room with the book on her lap. It was necessary to rest it on the lap because it was too heavy for her to hold up, which meant she had to sit leaning forward in order to read. And a strange sight it was, this tiny dark-haired person sitting there with her feet nowhere near touching the floor totally absorbed in the wonderful adventures of Pip and Ole Miss Havisham and her cobbed-whipped house, and by the spell of magic that Dickens, the great storyteller, had woven with his words. The only movement from the reader was the lifting of the hand every now and then to turn over a page, and Mrs. Phelps always felt sad when the time came for her to cross, to the, um, cross the floor and say, it is ten to five, Matilda. During the first week of Matilda's visits, Mrs. Phelps had said to her, Does your mother walk you down here every day and then take you home? My mother goes to um, Ellsbury every afternoon to play bingo, Matilda had said. She doesn't know I come here. But that's surely not right, Mrs. Phelps said. I think you'd better ask her. I'd rather not, Matilda said. She doesn't encourage reading books, nor does my father. But what did they expect you to do every afternoon in, in an empty house? Just mooch around and watch the telly. I see. She doesn't really care what I do, Matilda said, a little sadly. Mrs. Phelps was concerned about the child's safety. On the walk through the fairly busy village high street and the crossing of the road, but she decided not to interfere. Within a week, Matilda had finished Great Expectations, which in that edition contained 411 pages. I loved it, she said to Mrs. Phelps. Has Mr. Dickens written, uh, written any others? A great number said the astounded Mrs. Phelps. Shall I choose you another? Over the next six months, under Mrs. Phelps' watchful and compassionate eye, Matilda read the following books. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Tess of the Do. Ervilles by Thomas Hardy. Gone to Earth by Mary Webb. Kim by Rudyard Kipling. The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells. The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. The Good Companions by J. B. Priestley. Brighton Rock by Graham Greene. Animal Farm by George Orwell. It was a formidable list, and by now Mrs. Phelps was filled with wonder and excitement. But it was probably a good thing that she did not allow herself to be completely carried away by it all. Almost anyone else witnessing the achievements of the small child would have been tempted to make a great fuss and shout 
the news all over the village and beyond. But not so, uh, Mrs. Phelps. She was someone who minded her own business and had long since discovered it was seldom worth while to interfere with other people's children. Mr. Hemingway says a lot of things I don't understand, Matilda said to her. Especially about men and women, but I loved it all the same. The way he tells it, I feel like I'm right there on the spot watching it all happen. A fine writer will always make you feel that, Mrs. Phelps said. And don't worry about the bits you can't understand. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you like music. I will. I will. And there's an example of a simile. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you like music. Comparing the words in the book to music. Because two things were compared with the clue word like. Did you know, Mrs. Phelps said, that public libraries like this allow you to borrow books and take them home? Oh, I didn't know that, Matilda said. Could I do it? Of course, Mrs. Phelps said. When you have th uh, chosen the book you want, bring it to me so I can make a note of it. And it is yours for two weeks. You can take more than one if you wish. That's Matilda reading the books. From then on, Matilda would visit the library only once a week in order to take out new books and return the old ones. Her own small bedroom now became her reading room. And there she would sit and read most afternoons, often with a mug of hot chocolate beside her. She was not quite tall enough to reach things around the kitchen, but she kept a small box in the outhouse, which she brought in and stood on in order to get whatever she wanted. Mostly it was hot chocolate she made, warming the milk in a saucepan on the stove before mixing it. Occasionally she made um, bovril, bovril or Ovaltine. It was pleasant to take a hot drink up to her room and have it sit beside her as she sat in her silent room sit a reading in the empty house in the afternoons. The books transported her into new worlds and introduced her to amazing people who lived exciting lives. She went on olden day sailing ships with Joseph Conrad. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and to India with Rude um, Yari Kipling. She traveled all over the world while sitting in her little room in an English village. English um, village. That was chapter one. So we have our main character, which is our protagonist, Matilda. We have her family, the supporting characters, Mrs. Phelps, the librarian. The setting, we have multiple settings. We have Matilda's house in an English village and the library. The problem, Matilda's dad won't buy her a book. So because of that, Matilda takes it and problem solves and starts walking to the library. Then she discovers she's able to take them home. She's able to take books at home to read. The theme so far is being yourself because because Matilda is very, very unique, and that's a great thing, and she is owning who she is, and she's also a problem solver. She decided to go to the library by herself. Thank you for listening to Chapter 1 of Matilda. Tomorrow, we're going to read Chapter 2, Mr. Warmwood, the Great Car Dealer. Thank you for watching.